Good morning. Good morning to everyone on Facebook Live. Thank you for being with us this morning. For those that, of you here that are here and woke up early and turned your clocks back, yay, or forward, yay. <laughs> Welcome. We are glad to have you this morning. You have lots of elbow room in this this service, I think the next service is going to be pretty packed because people that think, oh, I overslept, I'll just go to the 11 o'clock, but that's okay. Welcome. We have just a little bit of business to take care of this morning. If you're visiting with us this morning, there is a connection card in the seat back pocket in front of you. If you would fill that out with your information, we would love to get in touch with you, keep in touch with you. Um, also, if you put your email address on there, We'll be able to send you the e-blast each week that tells you what's going on at South Point Church. So if you'll do that for us. And there's an insert, um, the yellow insert in your bulletin talks about the snowbird breakfast that we're having. That is the 25th. I can't get it out. There we go. Yes, March 25th at 9 o'clock. Um, Fill that out. Let us know how many of you are coming. Um, we love to see you come, and we hate to see you leave. But before you go, we want to just celebrate you. So just bring someone. Everything's provided. Just show up. But please let us know how many of you are coming so we have plenty of food. Amen. Ladies, this Saturday is March 18th. Are you guys ready for the Women's Conference? Yeah. I'm so excited, y'all. Just get ready. At 9 a.m., the breakfast start. Come ready for worship, fellowship, prayer, and the guys won't be there. Amen. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I'm excited. It's a ladies' conference. <laughs> We're so, so we'll excited. see you Saturday. Yes, it's fearless submission, which is going to be just an, an, an awesome time. Um, also, just very briefly, in your bulletin, um, it talks about the Fresh Start class, our new members class. If you want more information on either of those classes, you can put that on the, the um connection card as well and we'll have someone reach out to you the fresh start class um, that's at nine o'clock every morning so that's going on now um, and then the new members is right after the 11 o'clock service so um, either of those we'd love to have you be a part of that um, so just fill out a connection card to sign up and on Thursday nights we have celebrate recovery here it's at 6 p.m. Um, just come ready for worship food healing and a good time in the Lord okay yeah. And then on Wednesday nights, we have Essential Bible Studies. It starts at 7 p.m. It's an interactive class. Um, you can watch it online, but you can really enjoy it here in person as well. So come ready just to learn and go deeper in, in, into Bible studies and learn about Jesus. Absolutely. Amen. Are you guys ready to worship this morning? Yes, absolutely. If Pastor would come up, up and get us kicked off this morning. Yeah, I'm going to do it. Yes, we, Thank you. we are ready to I'm worship. I'm do that. Welcome, everybody. I think she's right. I think everybody left their clock back. But I, I think our 11 o'clock service is going to be one of those where everybody's coming in going, well, yeah. I want to share a, uh, I just want to share a nugget with you this morning that um, I feel like the Lord gave to me. Uh, over in Luke uh, chapter 13, uh, there's a story uh, that is titled, Jesus Heals the Crippled Woman. And I just want to share something with you. It says, on the Sabbath... Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues and, and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. Do you know there are spirits out there that can cripple you? There are things in this world that will literally take your life from you. And I don't mean die, because that, 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 but they will take your life. They will take the joy from your life. They will cripple you. They will oppress you. They will depress you. They will do any and everything they can possibly do to stop you from worshiping the Lord. The Bible speaks clearly that there was a spirit that crippled this woman for 18 years. Listen, it says she was bent over and couldn't straighten up at all. You see, when that spirit crippled her, that spirit didn't want her doing this. The spirit wanted her doing this. So all she could see was the ground. All she could see was what was directly in front of her. 
She couldn't see anything that was going on around her, and she couldn't straighten up to lift her eyes unto the heavens. And the Bible says this. It says, when Jesus saw her, not when she saw Jesus, but when Jesus saw her, he called her forward. He called her forward, and he said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. And he put his hands on her, and immediately she straightened up and praised God. You see, that's what happens when we have that encounter with Jesus. I want to say to you this morning as we begin our worship, if you're struggling with something, if you've got something going on in your life, if you've got something that, that seems to have you bound or maybe even crippled, Jesus is here this morning through the Holy Spirit of God to touch you and to release you. Because you see, he wants your eyes toward heaven. He wants your arms lifted high. He doesn't want you walking around looking at the ground. That's why he gave us the Holy Spirit of God. So that we can praise him and glorify him as he so deserves. So if you've got something going on in your life, I just want you to know that the Holy Spirit is here this morning to release you so that you can have your life back. Amen? Amen. All right. You guys ready to worship? Yeah. Stand up. Y'all yeah. stand up. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for bringing us together here this morning, Father, that we might worship you. And Lord, we give you praise for that. We ask God this morning that in the name of Jesus, that you would just take charge of our service. Your word says where two or more have gathered, you're right there. So Father, we know you're here. So we ask God that you would just take charge of this service and we pray God and ask that if there's someone here this morning that is struggling, touch them. If there's someone here this morning that is broken, fix it. I ask God that you would help us to fix our eyes on Jesus for you alone are the author and perfecter of our faith. And Father, we thank you for meeting us here this morning. And all God's people said, amen and amen. Good morning. You guys ready to praise God? Come on, give God some praise this morning. If he's been good to you, come on, someone shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. What a great day to be in the house of the Lord. So we just want to let them know that we love them this morning. I was buried beneath my shame. Hey, 
this morning. He called your name. He called my name. Fill this room with praise. I need to rescue my sin was heavy. The chains break at the weight of your glory. I need a shelter, I was in Lord. You call me a citizen of heaven. Because he is worthy of the praise. It doesn't matter how we feel. We just want to make sure we give him glory. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. Come on, let's put our hands together. All right, you know how this goes. Here we go. Whoa, 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 whoa. You ready? You sound good this morning. See you. Shine your light, shine 
mountains The cars on highways through the sea I've seen this power metal battles right in front of me
There's no power like the mighty name of Jesus. Get, get that thing in your head. Whatever it is, whatever is bothering you, I want you to declare over it. Ready? Say. There's no power like the mighty name of Jesus. And at the same time, we can be thanking for what he's already doing, what he's already moving out of our lives. I'll say it again. There's no power like the mighty name of do it again. Jesus. No power. There's no power like the mighty name of Jesus. There's no power. There's no power like the mighty name of Jesus. have a church family, you don't have to tithe there. I'm sure that your church can use it as much as we can, so uh, you're welcome to just tithe there. But I want to go ahead and call the ushers forward, and uh, as they're coming, uh, I just want to say to you that, you know, here at South Point Church, we have a finance ministries team that basically governs the, what what God gives us and we do what we feel like God would have us do with it. We try to help feed those who are hungry and keep the lights on for those who are cold and, and need lights and, and then we try to take care of the church as best we can as well. And so we just invite you to give according to the way the Lord has laid it on your heart to give. All right? Father, we thank you for your blessing today. And we thank you for what we're about to receive. Just ask for wisdom, Lord, that you'll help us to use it in a way that will bring glory and honor to you. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 for me if you will back there thank you for that i want to welcome everybody once again to south point church this morning i want to welcome everybody that's with us online this morning as well this morning we are in our fifth week 
of our series of Running with the Giants. And uh, I shared with you in one of my earlier uh, messages, probably back around the first or second message, that uh, I have preached a, a series like this before back in 2020. Uh, different people, uh, but same theme, and basically the uh, uh, same direction and all. Uh, but this one has different, different people in it. Everyone seemed to have really enjoyed that series uh, after it was all done, and, and so they came and, and was talking about that, and I thought, well, let's just, let's just do that again. So only we're going to put some different people in there. Uh, I've also shared with you in some of my earlier messages that this series uh, came about through a book that was written by a pastor uh, by the name of John Maxwell. A book that he wrote here is called Running with the Giants. And if you take a look at this, and I'm not sure you can read all of this up here, but uh, down here, the, the caption down here below, it says, Running with the Giants, what the Old Testament heroes uh, want to know, want you to know, I'm sorry, what the Old Testament heroes want you to know about life and about leadership. And what they're referring to there are the Old Testament heroes back in uh, chapter 11 in the book of Hebrews. If you haven't read that, I invite you to do that. Um, it's an excellent uh, chapter. It talks about some of the heroes of faith and, and, um, and, and what they have done, gone through with their life in there. Now, throughout this entire series, uh, we have been using one verse of Scripture, um, and that verse comes from Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, and it goes like this. It says, Therefore, and therefore is, 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 tells us that it's a continuation of chapter 11. It says, But therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, he says, Let us throw off Throw off everything, not just some, not just part, but let us throw off everything in our life that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles us and gets us all messed up. It says, let us throw those things off. And look what it says. And let us run with perseverance the race that has been marked out for us. The Bible is clear and that, that in, in other scriptures as well that our life is considered to be a race. It's a race that has been marked out for us. And last week I shared some other scriptures with you that kind of validated that as well. And before we get into our message, I want to go ahead and I want to um, touch on something else. Here in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, the witnesses that, that, that they're referring to are those heroes of faith. Those heroes of faith that are in heaven, that are uh, 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 there because they, they, they stood on their faith during those difficult times in their life. And they are witnesses for us because they went through those difficult times. They made it through those difficult times because of their faith in God. And so they, they, they are witnesses to us saying to us, guys, I know that you have difficult times in life. I know that there are things in life that, that really just, it, it's just, that, that, that just stink. If I could just be real honest, I mean, life gets that way every once in a while, doesn't it? I mean, doesn't it? Come on, guys, doesn't it? Life gets that way every once in a while. And these guys went through that the same way. Guys, girls, women, they, they, we've all gone through it here, and they went through it as well. And they're saying to us, as witness to us, guys, we made it through those difficult times. We stood on our faith in God. We saw what was coming. We stood there. We made it through those difficult times. We made it into heaven because we, we, we stood on those difficult times. And they're saying that, that, that we are witnesses that you can make it too. Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't fall back. Don't let Satan get a hold of you. Don't let the world get a hold of you, man. They're saying stand strong on your faith and you can make it. I want to uh, ask you to do something for me once again. Uh, I want you to use your imagination, and I ask this each week in this series, but I need you to do that for me because I want to share with you that this chapter, uh, of this verse in this chapter, it paints a picture for us. And, and, and I want you to just kind of imagine this with me, if you will. But I want you to imagine that you are standing in this Colosseum. Watch this right there. And just, I want you to imagine that you're down on the floor of the Colosseum. 
down on the track is a track. And you're down there, and you're getting ready to run this race that has been marked out for you. And up in the stands of this Colosseum are all of these heroes of faith that are watching you. And they're cheering you on, they're rooting you on, and they're saying, man, don't you quit. I need you to make this. I need to see you in heaven. I need, to, I need you to finish this race, and I need you to finish it well. They're up there cheering you on. I, you can do it. I know you can do it. I, I know you can do this. And they're up there cheering you on. And the crowd is screaming and roaring at you, rooting you on to run this race and not quit and not give up and not fall back. But the whole series is built around this one thought. What if just one of those heroes of faith had something really important to tell you? They're in the mix up there of all of the people that are sitting around the Colosseum. They're all screaming and hollering, and, but you can't hear the one person. So the mindset of the thought of this is simply this. What if they came down from the stands and ran with you? What if that one person who had that... That's something to tell you about life. You see, they've already run the race. They already, they've already seen the pitfalls. They've already seen the trouble and the struggles and the things that we have to go through. They've already seen all of that. They've already dealt with that. They've already gone through that. So now they're coming and saying, let me go down. Let me run with them. Let me go down and run with them so that I can help them understand what's ahead of them. And that way they can, we can deviate from some of those things. We can get away from some of those problems, some of those things that that they're going to struggle with. I want to show you something. Watch this. Let's go back to that book again. What the Old Testament heroes want you to know about life. That's what the whole series is about. In our first week of this series, Isaiah came down, and here's what he said. This is what he left us with. If you have a genuine encounter with God, not a casual meeting, but if you have a genuine encounter with God, it changes everything. Your life changes, your world changes, your family changes, your finances changes. Everything about you changes when you have a, when you have a genuine encounter with God. In our second week, Jacob came, and here's what Jacob left us with. Man, let God have control of your life. Quit trying to do it yourself. Quit trying to think you're better than God. Quit trying to think you're smarter than God. He's the creator. Let God have control of your life and watch what happens to your life. The third week, Pastor Ron came in and shared a message with us uh, about the judges and, and, how, and what they would have to say to us. Last week, we talked about Jonah. And Jonah, Jonah had some things to say to us, look at this, about bad choices. Some of the bad choices that we make in life. Guys, we've all made bad choices in life. We've all done things that we look back and say, I wish I hadn't done that. I wish I could take that back. We've all done that. And Jonah was that person that, that had that to say to us last week. This morning, we've got an Old Testament prophet by the name of Elisha that's coming to talk to us. Now, it's not Elijah. It's Elisha. Elisha was Elijah's prophet. Uh, disciple or his follower so to speak and Elisha has some things to say to us but before I get into all that I just want to give you a little bit of it about his backstory he was a prophet of God and he followed God and he prophesied for God for about 60 years but here's here's one of the interesting things about Elijah when Elijah found him he was out plowing his fields he was out walking behind his oxen with a plow in his hand. And he was out there plowing his fields. And listen, he wasn't doing anything spiritual. He wasn't doing anything spiritual. He, he wasn't doing anything spectacular to, to have him in, in, touch, in touch with God. He wasn't doing anything God-related. He was plowing his fields, man. He was plowing his fields. And the prophet Elijah, the Bible says, Elijah went to him, saw him in the field, went to him, took his cloak, and threw his cloak around him. Didn't say a word. 
Elijah did not say one word to him. The Bible says he threw his cloak around him, and we're going to look at that here in a moment, and then turned around and walked away. But immediately, when Elijah threw his cloak around him like that, Elisha knew that it was God's call for him to come into the ministry. You know, it's funny. Isn't it funny, though? I mean, y'all, y'all, y'all can relate to this, I'm sure, but isn't it funny how the Holy Spirit sometimes will talk to you or do something, and you just know that you know that it's the Holy Spirit? You see, that, that's what happened here with Elisha. He knew it was God. Elijah didn't have to say a word to him. He knew it. So Elisha, he stopped what he was doing. He hollers back at Elijah, and he says, I need to just, a minute, I need to go back and say goodbye to my family. Elijah told him to go. He went. And listen, now watch this. Elisha went back home. He went back home. He slaughtered his oxen. He said goodbye to his family. He slaughtered his oxen. He burned all of his farming equipment, the plows and everything. He cooked up the oxen gave it to his family and the people there in the villages, all of the meat, and then he left and went to follow Elijah. And here's the point. When God called Elisha into the ministry, he called him and Elisha answered the call immediately. Here, listen to this. He went back home. He, he goes back home. He takes the things that are most valuable to him, his oxen, He slaughters them. He burns the plows. He burns all of the instruments that he had there. You see, and he did all that, leaving him, look, listen to me, he leaving him no option to go back to that life. Are you understanding me? He he burned all of his equipment. He slaughtered all of the all of his auction, uh, his, his oxen, and that's when his ministry truly began. God saw his heart. God saw the answer to his call. And Elisha, he couldn't go back. He couldn't go back now because there was nothing left for him to go back to. So he began to to disciple under Elijah. And Elijah began to teach him about the things of God and the things about being a prophet and 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 the way to go and the way to hear God. Elijah began to teach him all of these things. And now watch this. When the time came for Elijah to die, this is amazing, but the Bible says God sent chariots of fire to pick him up and take him to heaven. Chariots of fire. How would you like to enter heaven like that? You know, and Elisha, he was left there by himself at this point. He had a double helping of Elijah's spirit on him at that point in time. And stay with me right here. Throughout his ministry, Elijah stood up for God. He prophesied to kings and many of the other important people. He had performed miracles that were amazing. One of the things that just slips by us is Elisha, he parted the Jordan River. See, we know about how Moses parted the, 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 the Red Sea and walked across on dry land. But we, sometimes we miss the port, the port, the part where Elisha parted the Jordan, so that he could walk across on dry on dry ground. But he parted the Jordan River. He came upon a lady that that she was dying. She, she, they had just a little. She said, "I've got just a little bit of flour here to make bread, a little bit of oil." She said, "I don't have anything else." She said, "My son and I will die after this because we don't have any food and we don't have any way to make anything like that." And Elisha said, "You make that for me." You make that and give that to me. So she did. She was obedient to what Elisha said. She did. And Elisha said, go get your jars. Get your oil jars. And she went and got her oil jars. And Elisha prayed. And God began to fill those oil jars. And it says that she, they filled every single jar until there was no jars left in there. You see, God is faithful to those who are faithful. God is faithful to those who are faithful. Elisha raised two people from the dead, and then he healed uh, a Naaman of his leprosy. He told him to go down to the Jordan River. He said, wash yourself in the river seven times, and you'll be healed of all of your leprosy. 
But the main thing that I want us all to understand this morning is this. Elisha was just an ordinary man. He was just like you and me. There, there was nothing special uh, uh, about him. Man, he was out working in his fields when God called him. I mean, he was out there. He, 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 he woke up that morning. He woke up that morning and went to the fields just like every other day. And I'm sure that there were many days in his life when he was out there in the fields that, that he was walking behind that plow, listen to me, asking himself, man, is this all there is to my life? Is this, is this it? I get up in the morning, I go to work. I, I, I go to work, I come home, I sleep a little bit, eat a little bit of dinner, get up the next morning, go to work, walk behind the plow, feed my oxen, come home. Is this all there is to my life? You see, I'm sure that Elisha had those days when he asked himself, does my life really matter? Is there anything else? And there may be times in your life when you have asked yourself that same question. Is this all there is to my life? Is this it? I'm just here to, to go through each day? Wake up and do this and go to bed and wake up and do this again? Is that all there is to my life, Lord? You see, we ask ourselves those questions. Well, I want to I I ask you something. You, know, you may say, does my life count? Does my life really matter? And I want to tell you, yes, it does. I want to tell you, yes, it does. God don't make junk. God don't make junk. You see, you were created with, with a purpose. I want to show you this, and this is my probably this is probably my favorite scripture in all of the Bible. Jeremiah 29 11 says this. This is God talking. He said, I know the plans, I know the purpose that I have for you, declares the Lord. My plan is to prosper you. I want to prosper you. I want to prosper you so that people can see your life and say, my goodness, I want what that person has. I want what they have inside of them. I want to feel what they feel inside of them. He says, I know the plans I have for you. My plans are to prosper you, not to harm you. I want to give you hope. I want to give you hope and a future. And then look at Psalm 138.8. And the Lord will fulfill that purpose for me. You see, this is what the Bible says. That's the, uh, the, the English Standard Version. So as we get into our insert this morning, if you guys are going to write down on your insert this morning, I think the first thing that Elisha would say to us as he comes down onto the track to run this race that has been marked out for us, I think the, th the, the first thing that he would say to us is this. Watch this. Wherever God puts you, man, give it your best. Wherever God puts you, don't complain. Don't gripe about it. Don't do the woe is me. Wherever God puts you, give it your best. Whether you're walking behind the, uh, uh, the oxen out, out in the field, whether you're working in a factory, you're a stay-at-home mom, whatever, whatever, whatever you do, wherever God puts you, give it your best. You see, when a person, listen, when a person is giving it their absolute best, God sees that. God sees that. The Bible says God, the eyes of the Lord go back and forth over the earth looking for those who are faithful. He sees what we do on this earth. And the Bible says that God rewards the faithful. He rewards the faithful. But when a person chooses to live their life with, a, with that half-hearted, I guess, attitude toward their life, God sees that too. But listen, so does everyone else. So does everyone else. When, when, uh, there, there's a story about this guy that goes into this, uh, this company that wants to get a job. And he goes in and he talks to the personnel manager. And he says, man, I really need the job. He said, I want to get the job. And the personnel manager said, well, I'd love to hire you, man. He said, but, but right now, he said, we're just pretty much overstaffed. We really, we really don't need anybody else. He said, we're just we're kind of overstaffed. And the guy says, man, can't you just give me a chance? He said, the little bit of work that I do wouldn't be, be noticed. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> Here's what Colossians 3.23 says. 
work willingly at whatever you do as though you're working for the Lord. Do it as though you're working for the Lord and not people. Before we move on, I want you to understand something this morning. You have a purpose. I, I, I have to drive this point home. You're not an accident. You're not an accident. You were not created through some big bang theory. <laughs> not at all. God created you. And God gave you a purpose. You have a reason for being here. Your life, listen to me. Everybody look at me just for a minute. Your life counts for something. Your life counts for something. We'll move on. Here, here's your next point. If you give your best in secret, God will reward it. If you give your best in secret, God will reward it. And, 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 what, and what exactly does that mean, Pastor Rocky? Well, <laughs> let, let, me, let me say it like this. The world is full of people that can't wait to tell somebody about all the good things they're doing so they can get praise from them. Hello? I mean, the world is filled with people that will do that. There are some people that will do just about anything they can do if they, if they think somebody's watching them. Because at that point, they can get an attaboy. You with me? But here's what Matthew 6, chapter 1 Chapter 6, verse 1 through 4 says. He said, you be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others so that you can be seen by them. You be, be careful not to do that. He said, because if you do that, you'll have no reward from your Father in heaven. He goes on to say this. So when you give something to the needy or when you do something for the Lord, don't announce it with trumpets like the hypocrites do. He said, don't do that. He said, they do it in the synagogues to be, to be in, in the streets so that they can be honored by others. He said, but I want to tell you, they've received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, when you do something for the Lord, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Don't even let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. So that what you do, what you've given, maybe in secret. He said, because then your father, who sees what is done in secret, then he'll reward you. Does that make sense? Yes. That makes sense, doesn't it? Yes. Get back to Elisha, or um, Elisha. Watch this in First Kings nineteen nineteen. Watch this. Here's the part I, was gonna, I, I told you about earlier. Elijah went and found Elisha the son of Shaphat, plowing on a field. There were 12 teams of, of oxen in the field, and Elisha, he says here, was plowing with that 12th team. That's two teams, two oxen in a team. Elisha, Elijah went over to him and just threw his cloak across his shoulders. Look at this. And then he walked away. And then he just up and walked. He didn't say a word. He didn't say anything. But Elisha knew that God had called him into the ministry. And listen, God didn't call him through a dream. God didn't call him through a time of prayer. He didn't call him when he was up on a mountaintop. God, that's not when God called him. God called him when he was out working the fields. And there are stories throughout the entire Bible where God has done other people by the same way. I want to show you something that a pastor by the name of Ray Pritchard said. Watch this. God called Moses while he was tending Jethro's flocks. He called David while he was tending his father's sheep. He called Nehemiah, who had a hugely important job as a cupbearer to the king. He called Peter when he was a fisherman and Matthew when he was a tax collector. He called Elisha when he was plowing the field. He said, we are far more likely to encounter God by getting out of bed and getting busy doing our job than if we stay in bed waiting for a dream or a vision. Make sense? Here's, here's the application to that. 
When God sees that we are faithful with our life, when he sees that we're faithful with our life, he will call you to do more. When he sees that you have accomplished what he set you out to accomplish, he will give you more. And that brings me to my next point. Because I think the next thing that Elijah would say is this. What's this? When you do your best in the small things, well, God will give you some bigger things to do. I remember Mary and I were in Indiana. And um, I didn't know the Lord. I was a wild child. And um, I had a band, played guitar, uh, did vocals. uh, Seven years played out. Wrote songs, had a pretty nice catalog. I got this hankering. Y'all know what a hankering is, right? I got this hankering to go to Nashville. So I took off and we went to Nashville. I was just looking for to check the place out. And I got there. I took my songs, took my catalog. And you know how shy I am. I, <laughs> what? So I start meandering around to the, to the uh, uh, record companies and trying to get through the door to talk to people. And I ended up at, at the United Artists Tower and ended up getting a publisher for, my, for all my songs. Ended up getting into Aris, uh, Arista Records. Got one of my songs picked up there at Arista Records. And things were going well. Mary and I were going to the Grand Ole Opry. Never went through the front door. Always in the back door. We'd go back and rub elbows with guys and girls. And I mean, it's just, it's just we were in that state back then. A guy I worked with asked me to go to church, and I told him no. And he asked me again, and I told him no. And I shared this here a little while back, but it continued on until I finally ended up going to church. Ended up loving the church once I went. Ended up getting saved. Became a youth pastor. I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> Started working with children. It, 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 was, it was awesome what God was doing. Mary and I got so involved with the kids. God saw it. And then the progression started. God called me to, into, into the ministry. So I, I became ordained as a pastor. Ended up being the associate pastor at my church. And I would go out and preach at churches where pastors were on vacation and things like that, and they needed somebody to preach for them. I'd go preach throughout the state of Tennessee. I'd go preach. We moved there, by the way. We had moved there. And I'd go preach for these, these guys. And when God saw that I was faithful to that call, then God called me into the ministry, and he said, I have a church for you. I didn't want to go, but he said, I have a church for you. So we ended up at our church in Lewisburg, Tennessee. Fifteen years I pastored that church. Fifteen years, God kept me there. But what I didn't realize is when we retired and left the church there, we moved to Florida. We, we were snowbirds. <laughs> we bought a fifth wheel and a truck. And, uh, I mean, we were snowbirds. And we decided that we're going to move to Florida and just th- for the winter, and then we'll go back to Tennessee during the summer and just kind of spend the, the, the summer in Tennessee. Sold our property. We're just going to live in the fifth wheel. Got ended up coming to Florida, but what I didn't realize is that God was bringing us to Florida. That's right. He ended up putting us in a church, which took us to another church, became the men's pastor. I preached a conference, and one of the guys came up to me and said, would you mind preaching at a church we have in Bushnell? We don't have a pastor. <laughs> that was three years ago. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. But the, the, the point that I'm making is that when you're faithful with the little things, God will move you to the bigger things. So y'all need to get into children's ministry. (laughs) Y'all need to start working with children, and God will give you something bigger. (laughs) God is good. I want to show you a scripture in Luke 16.10. Look at this. If you're faithful in the little things, you'll be faithful in the larger ones. But if you're dishonest or unfaithful in the little things, Man, you won't, be, you won't be faithful with your or honest with your greater responsibilities either. So, so here's, here's the point. Do your best, man. Do your best, no matter how insignificant something may seem to be, because God sees everything that we do. 
He sees everything that we do. And when we are faithful with the little things, listen, he will put you in charge of the greater things. Does that make sense? Okay. The next thing that I think Elisha would want to say to all of us is probably one of the most important. Go with me here. Watch this. When you give your best in the natural, God will do the supernatural. When you give your best in the natural, God will do the supernatural. When God, when God does something great in our life, God expects us to share that because it moves mountains. It changes people's lives. And with that said, I want to share a testimony just real quick. It's not my, my, not my personal testimony, but I want to tell you about something that happened here last Sunday. And I've already asked for permission to share this so that everybody knows. Last Sunday, we've got uh, a couple in the church of snowbirds. And um, Rick and Sandy. And um, Sandy came in last year and had problems with her knees. They went back to Colorado, I think it was. Knees still bothering her. Ended up coming back this year because this is where all their doctors are, here. Can't wait for them to move here. Went to the doctor. The doctor said, the only thing we can do is a full knee replacement. Just do a complete knee replacement and be done with it. So they scheduled the knee replacement for last Tuesday. And Sandy was going in. I contacted Rick to ask him if he wanted to come have lunch with us or send out a text or something. I think Paul had asked him. I think Paul was the one that asked him if he wanted to come and, and, and have men's breakfast with us. And he said, I'm probably going to be at home with my wife because she's going to have knee, knee surgery and i got to stay pretty close. Understandable. But last Sunday, during the invitation, Rick asked Sandy, he said, let's go up and pray. They got up, they came up here, and they sat right here. And Pastor Paul came up to pray with them. Pastor Raul came up to pray with them. And Pastor Diane, Raul's wife, came up to pray with them. They anointed her, I believe Paul said, and prayed over her. Only they didn't pray for the surgery. They prayed for healing. They didn't ask God to, to, to take charge of the surgery and lead and guide the hands of the doctors and, and Lord, if you don't want to heal her, they didn't go that route. They went straight into a, we need her to be healed and we know what you said in your word. After they finished praying, they got done. They went home. Sandy looked over at Rick and she said, I, she said, my leg doesn't hurt. I said, really? He said, Rick, and Rick said, really? And she, she said, no, my, my, my knee doesn't hurt at all. Rick said, I was a little skeptical. We went to bed that night. I was wanting to wake up the next morning and see what was going on. Woke up the next morning, asked her how her leg is, and she said, it's perfect. She said, there's nothing wrong with my knee. So they waited until Tuesday morning. Woke up Tuesday morning because this is the day of the surgery. And there's nothing wrong with her knee. They called and canceled the surgery. Amen. They called and canceled the surgery. I asked Rick yesterday, and Rick said, well, he gave a testimony yesterday at the men's breakfast, and he said, she's perfect. There's nothing wrong with her knee. God healed her knee. You see, when you give God your best in the natural, God will show you the supernatural. God will show you that he is real. Now, I'm going to start winding down, but I don't want to close just yet without giving you some words of encouragement, maybe some application here to all of this. And here's the first one that I want to do. You know, if you want what God has to give you, guys, listen, you guys have to hear me. God has a plan for your life. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to use your, I want you to use your imagination with me again, because we're running this race, right? Elisha's talking to us right now. But I want to, I want to give you another mental image. And this is just a Pastor Rocky image, so go with me. Take it for what it is. Up in heaven, I can just imagine that there's this big room and it's got your name on it. It says John. Up there. 
This one over here says Christine. That little bitty room back here is not. God's got these rooms, and inside those rooms are all of the blessings that God has for you while you're here. Every time you do something that is right, good, what have you, faithful, God opens the door and reaches in and gets one of those blessings and places it upon you. Just, just an image here. God says, I want to give you, I want to bless you. I want to give you what I have for you. God has something for you. And here's what he says. If you really, truly want to receive it, watch this next point. You need to cultivate the presence of God in your life. You need to cultivate that. You see, Elisha's out in the fields plowing, and the fields are hard. The dirt's hard. If any of you know something about farming, then you know that you've got to break up the dry ground, the dirt, dirt the, the hard, dirty ground. You, you can't plant, you can't throw seeds out on that because it won't grow. You have to cultivate that ground and get that ground soft and get it pliable so that you can put your seed in there and it'll take root and it'll grow. And the same is true with God. Amen. This world's full of people that have a hard heart. They have a hard heart and the seed of God won't grow. That, 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 that heart has to be cultivated. You have to be de to develop a relationship with the Holy Spirit. You have to deepen, and I don't mean just de develop a relationship. You have to deepen your relationship with the Holy Spirit. Can I go down a rabbit hole for a quick second? Yes. Wow. When God created you, listen, when God created you, the Bible says in, where did I write that down? Genesis 2, 7. Watch. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. That word breath in the original translation is neshema. And neshema means spirit. So what happened is God breathed into his nostrils the spirit of life, and he became a living being. See, in Proverbs 20, look at this, verse 27, the human spirit is the lamp of the Lord that sheds lights on the ones in remote being. You have a spirit inside of you. Guys, you've got to listen to this. You've got to get this. When God created you, he put a spirit inside of you. This is the can that holds the green beans. That's all this is. This is the can that holds the green beans. That's it. The green beans are in there. You have a spirit inside of you. You have to get that. Now, God has a Holy Spirit. And when you give your life, your all, over to Jesus, I'm going somewhere with all this, so stay with me. We're going to get back to Elisha. When you surrender your life over to Jesus, I want to show you what happens in Acts 2.38. This is Peter on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem when the Holy Spirit fell upon everybody. Peter's out in the streets preaching. And he said, they said, what do we do to be saved? And he said, you need to repent and be baptized, every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins so that you can wipe those sins away. Look what he says. And you will receive the gift of what? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. So when you get saved, listen, you got this spirit living inside of you. And when you get saved, God sends the Holy Spirit to live inside of you. God, now, now you've got your spirit in here and you've got God's spirit in here. You've got these two spirits living, living in, in, inside of you. Now, the question is, why does God do that? Why does God send his Holy Spirit to live in there? I mean, aren't we just content to, 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 for him to be out here? I mean, why in here? I want to show you why. In Romans 8, 16. Because the Spirit, now watch this, stay with me. See that capital S? Hello, see that capital, capital S? That's the Holy Spirit. See that little S? That's our Spirit. The Holy Spirit himself is in there because he testifies with our Spirit 
that we're God's children. You see, God sent his Holy Spirit to live inside of you so that his spirit can tell you that you are one of his children. And so when I look at you and I say to you, do you know beyond the shadow of a doubt that I'm going to see you in heaven? I don't want to hear, I hope so. I don't want to hear, well, I think I'm good. I don't want to hear that because that tells me that you don't know because the Holy Spirit hasn't conveyed to you that you are. Are you guys with me? God's Holy Spirit will talk to your spirit. He will convey to your spirit. I have absolutely no question in my mind that when I die and leave this world, I'm going to heaven. I know that. There's a house built for me there, and I'm going to be there. And I know that I'm going to be there for all of eternity. I'm going to start preaching. I want to show you something else in John 14, 26. The advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father is going to send, who, 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 who you'll get. Watch this. Here's another reason. Because he's going to teach you. He's going to teach you all things. And he's going to remind you. This is Jesus talking. He said the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of you because he's going to teach you about all of the things of God. And he's going to remind you of everything that I have said to you. You see, all of these things happen when we cultivate that relationship with God and deepen our relationship with the Holy Spirit. And let me tell you something. Deepening our relationship with the Holy Spirit is not an easy task, given the world that we live in. And there's always something that wants your time. There's always something that seems to just be urgent. There's always something vying for your attention. Always something. And let's not forget about Satan. The Bible says he is the God of this age, and he'll do anything that he can to, to stop us from, 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 from developing or deepening that relationship with God. Haven't you ever noticed? Have you ever noticed that just when you're in your prayer time, and I'm, real, I'm talking to you, real, you ever break through? Have you ever prayed to the point where you literally just broke through and you, know, you knew that you were in a throne room in the presence of God? Now, I'm not talking about just walking around praying or on your knees. I'm talking about you just, you broke through, man. Have you ever noticed that when you're just in that state with God, you're praying, the phone rings? Have you ever noticed that the phone rings, the baby starts crying, the, the dog starts barking, somebody knocks on the door? You see, I want to let you in on something really important. Satan knows that if you deepen your relationship with God, if you, if you deepen that, that, that relationship through the Holy Spirit. Listen, watch this. You're no longer just a sheep. If you deepen that relationship with the Holy Spirit, uh, Holy Spirit, you become a warrior. You become a warrior. You become a force to be reckoned with. You're no longer one of the sheep that's in the herd. And Satan will do, listen, he will do anything he can to stop that. I'm going to show you a scripture in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. Look at this. The God, little g, Satan, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. He blinds the minds of those who don't know Jesus so that they can't even see the light of the gospel. He blinds them so that they can't, that they can't see because he doesn't want them to see the glory of Christ and the image of God. So he will blind them with something. He will put things in their mind, in their, in, in, in their life that's more important to them and they lose sight of everything that is important. I want to show you what happens. Well, I'm going to tell you what happens when you connect with God. Watch this. Acts 3.1, Peter and John healed the lame man. Acts 5.15-16, Peter's shadow fell on the sick, and they were healed. Acts 8.7, Philip casts out the demons and then healed the lame. Peter and John laid hands on believers to receive the Holy Spirit in Acts 8, 14. Peter raised Tabitha from the dead when she fell. Acts 9, Paul and Silas cast a demon out of a fortune-telling slave girl. You guys remember that one? Paul raised Eutychus from the dead after he fell out of that window. Remember that guy? 
He fell asleep up there in the window and fell out and died. Paul raised him from the dead. These men were no different than you and me. God is not a respecter of people. God doesn't love me. God doesn't love Peter any more than God loves you or me. I mean, nobody. God isn't a respecter of person. The only thing happened is they cultivated their relationship with God by spending time with him in prayer and through the Holy Spirit. I want to share one more thing with you. It's just one more. No, nope, two more. Before I close, here's your next point. What's this? Man, do something with what God has given you. Do something with what God has given you. God has blessed every one of us with talents and gifts for his glory. And it's easy to fall into the trap of just sitting on them and not doing anything with them. But, but I want to show you something. In James 2.26, this is what James said. As the body without the spirit is dead. <laughs> so, in other words, when you die, your spirit leaves. As the body without the spirit is dead. Faith without, the, without, without doing something with it, without, without the deeds, that also is dead. I, I'm, I'm not going to beat this up, but we all need to get off of our stool of do nothing and do something. I mean, it's just, just that simple. I, I had a note in my Bible, and I didn't find it till this morning. But this, this is the, I write, I write in my Bible and I highlight and everything else in my Bible. And, and this is a little note that I wrote next to, next to James 2.26. People that do nothing with their faith more than likely have a faith that does nothing for them. Amen. Amen. Oh, that hurt. <laughs> People that do nothing with their faith more than likely have a faith that does, does nothing for them. Okay, last thing I want to share with you is this. And this, this is the last takeaway. Watch this. And this is right here is super. Watch this. Don't base your life on the seen, but on the unseen. What does that mean? It means there is so much more to this life than what you can see with your eyes. There's a spiritual world around us. There's a spiritual world that is around us. And there's a battle going on in that spiritual world for your souls. Satan and his demons are fighting with every tooth and nail they can against the angels of God, the Holy Spirit of God. They're not going to win. I read the end of the book. They're really not going to win. But there's a spiritual battle that is going on for your soul. And it's important that we understand something. Every now and then, that spiritual battle will find its way into our natural world. And we will end up seeing the effects of it. Doesn't happen often, but every now and then we'll catch a glimpse of what's going on with us. And I just want to leave you with a couple of different aspects. In Ephesians chapter 6, 11 and 12, watch this. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Remember, he's, he's looking to blind the minds of unbelievers and to blind the minds even of the believers if he can. So put on the armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. He said, for our struggle, look what he says, our struggle, our fight, guys, it's not against flesh and blood, it's not against one another. He said, our fight is against, look what he says, it's against the rulers and the authorities and the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces in the evil of evil in the heavenly realms. It's in that, that, that spiritual world. And I was talking about how every now and then that battle, that, that, that it, it kind of shows itself. Look what happens in 13.2, Hebrews 13.2. Look at this. He said, don't forget to show hospitality to, to strangers. He said, for by doing so, some, he said, some people have, 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 have shown hospitality to angels without even knowing it. 
of showing hospitality to angels without even knowing it. So don't base your life on the seen. Base it on the unseen. The Holy Spirit is at work. He was at work last Sunday when he healed Sandy's knee. The Holy Spirit is at work. And so here's the last scripture I got for you. Right here. Fix your eyes on what is seen. But that's it. Fix your eyes. It says, not on what is seen, but what is unseen. There you go. Because what, we, what is seen is temporary. All this is going to go away. But what is unseen, that's eternal. That's something you'll have with you forever. That's something you'll take with you forever. So I, I want to just kind of close with this. And go ahead and get those lights for me. Ron, come on up. And, and I, I just want to share this one thing with you, and then we're going to close. And, 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 and I've said this in the past, and I just want to say it again. When God puts together a message like this, this is at Pastor Rocky sitting down, sitting down and thinking these things up. God gives me these things for somebody. And this whole message today is about answering the call that God has placed on your life. You know, the first call I shared with you before, the first call, the first, abs the first call that we have in our life is to be called into a relationship with God the Father through His Son, Jesus Christ. That's the first call. And until we get that right, nothing else matters. We have to get that part right. But then there's another call. Because you see, after you've received that call, after you've done what Elisha did, burned your plows and slaughtered the oxen, then God calls you into a deeper purpose. And I don't know if there's someone here this morning that is being called. I don't know if there's something that God has been speaking to you about something. Maybe you're being called into a ministry. Maybe you're being called to salvation. I, I don't know what, I don't know why God gave it to me and I don't know who you are. But God didn't give it to me for nothing. God gave it to me because someone needs to hear it. So I'm going to give you an opportunity to just talk to God. Because the Holy Spirit's here this morning. He's here this morning. And He can fix whatever's going on in your life. He can fix anything and everything that's going on in your life. He can fix it, but you've got to stop trying to fix it yourself. And you've got to turn yourself over to Him. And then you got to turn all of that over to him. So I'm just going to say this. I'm going to ask you to stand up right where you are. And I just want to say to you this morning, we're going to sing a song. I'd love to pray with you. If you want to make things right with God, if you want to accept a call into the ministry maybe or something, I don't know, maybe you want to work with children, hello? Hello? I just want to invite you to come up. Just let go of your chair. Don't worry about what don't worry about what anybody else is going to think or say. No, no, this isn't about that. This is about you and God. And I'll give you an opportunity to get things right. You may never have another day. You may never have another day to get things right. This may this be this may be the last day that you have. Come on up here, brother. This may be the last day that you have. I invite you to come. For those of you online, thank you for being a part of our service. I hope to see you on Wednesday at 7. We're going through the miracles of Jesus. I'd love to see you. You guys have a great week. If you need me, Pastor Rocky at southpointchurch.net. Hit me with, with an email. I promise I'll call you back.